Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to meet all of you today for the first talk of the internal track. Uh, let me introduce to you our speaker, Hans Asma, who will walk you today through the implementation of snapshots in Postgres and how this implementation can be improved. This talk lasts for 50 minutes. If you have questions, please feel free to ask them during the talk. And with that very short introduction, I hand it over to Hans. Thank you. And uh, hello from me too. And thank you for the great turnout. So a short introduction about me. I'm a senior database consultant or engineer at Cybertech. We've been running uh, Postgres, uh, uh, helping people run Postgres at Cybertech for 13 years now. So I've been done quite a bit of stuff. So everything from high availability to some occasional uh, light core hacking. And for me, the performance work on Postgres has been always near and dear to my heart. So that's where, where I'm coming from. So, but uh, because this topic is going to be quite complex, I'm so very glad to have this uh, first mm -hmm. slot before you are all tired from all of the other talks. So I have at least a small chance of being able to explain this to you. I'm hoping to do my best here. So I'm gonna go through a lot here. I'm gonna give you an overview of database con uh, concurrency in general, and uh, then uh, give you an overview of how do we solve this concurrency issue right now in Postgres, and what are the problems with it, and uh, then some ideas how to do it better. So let's first start uh, our discussion with what are snapshots? I think a lot of you, if not most, uh, know this by heart, but I'm uh, going to do a, like a first principles overview of uh, this database concurrency stuff so we are, everybody are understanding it it's the same way I do. And I'm going to try to point out which parts of the concurrency problem are inevitable from a mathematical standpoint. So everybody loves racing, right? It's actually not all that well defined what it means, but uh, the important parts for us is that uh, we want transactions uh, to be atomic, which means uh, that we don't see half a transaction. Either everything completes or nothing completes. So if you are changing many rows in the database, uh, then uh, they uh, happen all at once. The consistency part, uh, surprisingly, we are not going to talk about because this in ACID means a completely different thing, and this is just about the correctness of the database. But we are going to talk about the isolation, uh, where we can use the database without this any concurrency weirdness. We can uh, pretend that we have the database for ourselves, and we don't have to think about others. Otherwise, we would go insane. And of course, the durability is the most important part of it. Uh, it would be very easy to solve all of this if we don't have to actually store the data, but we do. So that's that's the important part of a database. So moving on to MVCC, uh, uh, there are some stuff that we need to do to get this ACID thing done. The first important part is that when we are running a query, we don't want to see the database uh, state changing. So half of the query returns uh, one result and uh, another part returns a result after a change has been made. This would uh, making construction of queries very difficult. So we want to see a single picture for the whole query. But at the same time, uh, we want to be uh, performing updates to the database because this uh, query might be running for a long time. So to be having any kind of a scale, we need to be updating and reading at the same time. And after we run this update, we actually want to see that the update completed. Uh, so if we book a seat, we want to check, did we actually get the seat or did somebody else get it? So we want to be reading our writes after it. But during this whole time, this uh, original query must see the original state because uh, the result must not change. So this basically means that we need to have different versions of rows available that are visible to different queries. And snapshots is the way that we uh, solve the question, which uh, query sees which version of the row. 
So uh, we do this by tagging every row in the database by a transaction ID. And then we have a way to answer a question. Uh, is this uh, row visible to the snapshot that we have in the database? And for reading, uh, we acquire a snapshot that answers the question, which, uh, the, which writes have already completed, but which are in the future. So we get the state picture like a photograph of the database. And if you want to make, make a same database, we would like the snapshots to be so that uh, if, we, if uh, we get a snapshot that sees some transaction has committed and another one has not committed, we cannot get a snapshot that sees them in the reverse order, that things happen in different orders in different parallel universes. Uh, but it gets complicated. One of the things is that uh, the writing transaction could be running uh, for a really long time. Either somebody fell asleep at the computer or we just have a ton of stuff we want to do and it takes time. Whatever the reason is, uh, we need to be able to run long transactions because otherwise it's not Postgres, it's something else. But at the same time, we want to run uh, short transactions and many of them. And this basically means that uh, the transaction starting order, the order that we assign the transaction IDs to our transactions, is not the same order when they become uh, visible to others. So they complete in different order. And even more importantly, while, while we are writing the data into our database, we are creating those new row versions, inserting, updating, deleting. We don't know in what order we will complete because uh, the transaction might be a short one, might be a long time. We don't we don't know ahead of time which type of data, which type of uh, transaction we are running right now. And uh, when we finally know uh, that we want to commit, uh, it's not really feasible to go back and rewrite everything because our transaction might have rewritten half of the database. So we actually have to have an indirection from the information we have on the row to the actual commit order, who sees what. So that we cannot escape anyway. This is also somewhat related to SQL isolation levels, um, where, where we can say that uh, what kind of consistency we want out of the database. So we have those read uncommitted where we basically don't have transactions, where we can see dirty, uh, dirty writes, uh, where help finished uh, transactions, which Postgres does not actually support. Uh, or we can get uh, every read seeing a new state of the database, or we can have a consistent view within a single transaction, or we can even make sure that different transactions uh, see the database uh, in, a, in some order. So this uh, serializable uh, isolation level doesn't specify what the order is, but it specifies that it has to be like they would have executed in some specific order. Unfortunately, this stuff was uh, defined quite a long time ago and it's not actually well defined. It's defined in terms of some anomalies in the SQL standard and it actually doesn't match our current uh, understanding of the problem space. There are many different ways to actually define consistency and uh, this is approximately the picture that it looks like. So those are the academic uh, uh, consistency levels that are available to us. And uh, here we have a hierarchy of different uh, consistency levels and uh, where the lower levels have less guarantees and higher levels have more guarantees. And we can see also there is two sides to this coin. There is the left side that is uh, concerned with the fact that we when we are updating multiple objects, uh, what kind of transaction orderings are possible? And the other one is uh, when we have multiple updates to a single object, what kinds of uh, orderings are possible? So for example, uh, can we see a uh, write that we just did? Serializable doesn't specify actually that we have to see our result we commit and the read may, may actually by the definition of serializable return an empty result. And I'm not going to go into this zoo in too much detail in the talk because it's uh, tight enough as it is. But uh, the important part is that uh, the higher consistency levels are not inherently better. Uh, they have uh, uh, they don't come for free. 
they have some restrictions that are impossible to implement in a way that uh, we have consistency and uh, network uh, connectivity at the same time. And this is important for availability when we have a replicated system. This means that uh, the system is down when it can communicate properly. And also interesting is uh, that it also affects response time because uh, from the standpoint of a database, bad latency and unavailability is the same thing. So they are indistinguishable. So we ideally we would want the users to be able to pick what level of consistency they need to implement their application correctly and how much are they willing to give up to get performance. So that said, let's see how this uh, stuff happens in Postgres today. So how do we do snapshots in Postgres? So when a transaction starts writing, it acquires a transaction ID. Basically, uh, we have a counter in shared memory, we increment it, and we get a next file number, just a, like a sequence in your regular table. And then we publish it in uh, shared memory as a running transaction. And then uh, when we need to acquire a snapshot, uh, using this uh, get snapshot data function we have in Postgres, uh, we use it uh, to fill in the following information. First, we figure out what is the latest transaction uh, ID that has been completed. And that means that everything that is bigger than this by definition uh, is not completed yet. So that's going to be in the future. We also make note what is the smallest transaction ID that is available to us that is currently running. Because uh, anything uh, that is uh, smaller than currently running transactions must have completed already because we are not handing out smaller numbers after the fact. We are only incrementing the transaction ID. So this means that we can easily define the past. Between, between this X min and X max, there is a range where it's, uh, we need to figure out which ones were concurrent with our snapshots. And uh, this is done using uh, the list of running transactions, with, which is stored in the XIP uh, field in the snapshot. And the way we determine uh, is this visible or not, is this completed or not, is uh, we check if uh, the transactional ID we are looking at is in this list. If it's in this list, it was running, means it didn't complete yet. If it's not in this list, means it must have committed because uh, the transaction IDs don't disappear into thin air. So we handed it out and it's no longer running, means done. But we still have to figure out, did it commit or did it draw back? So if it uh, failed, uh, it uh, will have a zero bit in PG exact. If it committed, it will have a one bit in PG exact. So we check the exact SLR to see, did we finish? And effectively, this means that uh, the visibility order of our transactions is determined by the order that we update uh, this proc array shared memory data structure uh, where we remove our uh, our XID as the running transaction. After we remove this, all the snapshots that are taken after this will see us as completed. Uh, this has worked basically this way for 26 years now, uh, with some performance improvements along the way, uh, but it does have some issues. So there are some essential scalability issues with this proc array method. And the reason is that uh, to remove ourselves from this proc array, we have to take an exclusive lock in it. And to get a snapshot, we also have to lock this data structure so nobody is removing uh, transaction IDs from the list. So we get a consistent picture of who is running. And this proc array is uh, growing all of the time. Uh, we have more CPUs, we have disks that are capable of handling more writes and so on. So we will have always more and more transactions that are trying to compete to ac acquire this proc array lock in an exclusive mode. Uh, and in the meantime, we will also have more snapshots that are taken and those snapshots have to build ever bigger and bigger snapshots. So they will also need more time. So it's like an N-squared problem there. 
we have done some quite heroic improvements over the time to make it uh, as fast as it is today. So right now we have we have done stuff like we publish uh, the XID that we are running in a lock-free manner. We don't actually acquire the lock, we just uh, write it blindly there and ensure by memory ordering that it's visible to the right uh, backends at the right time. We also do group commit, so if uh, lots of different backends are trying to update this proc array at the same time, uh, they queue up and uh, one of the committers updates the proc array for everybody, which uh, reduces the contention on this lock and makes it more scalable. And also in uh, Postgres 14, we have some major improvements on the snapshot side. Uh, where we arrange the data in a slightly different way where the XIDs that are currently running are stored in a dense array all in one go, which makes it much, much faster to scan. And the results that we do get from there, the snapshot that we build that's stored until the next commit. So we can reuse it in workloads where we have more reads than commits, which is a quite significant fraction of our users. And for this means that for most people, actually, this uh, proc array con lock contention is not a major issue today. But our bag of tricks to make it uh, run ever faster is starting to go to get small. We have a couple of other options that we can still do. We can maybe uh, vectorize this uh, get snapshot data to make it slightly faster. Uh, we can make the snapshot cache that we have in Postgres 14 uh, lock free, and we can maybe incrementally update this uh, cache when transactions commit, so we don't have to rebuild it. But we can remove remove running XIDs from this snapshot. So we still have some options, but it's not much. Uh, but uh, more importantly, we have some issues with sub transactions. So uh, sub-transactions means that we can have an unlimited amount of transaction IDs effectively for each uh, top-level transaction. And uh, we need to also include those in the snapshots to figure out were they running or not. And there is some limited space in proc array to store this information. Right now it is, uh, it is 64 sub-transactions, which means that uh, if we cannot track this in shared memory anymore, then the snapshots that we build do not know about every running transaction. And this means that uh, for every XID that we see within this snapshot, we have to uh, figure out what is the top level transaction first, which means uh, looking up uh, the top level transaction ID from this uh, sub transaction SLRU. And uh, this is a significant performance hit on the primary. And it's even worse on the replica. Also, another issue is that the commit order on primaries and replicas is not the same. On primaries, as I said, uh, the order that we acquired this proc array lock in uh, determines who is visible when. Whereas in the replica, uh, we make uh, the transactions visible as they arrive to us uh, over the transaction log. So if you look at the really redacted and small version of the code here, this means that uh, we first uh, write into the transa in, into transaction log this commit record that says we are intending to commit. Then we have to wait until it gets to disk. Uh, we have to wait until it's synchronously replicated. And once those are done, uh, we can uh, finally make this transaction visible. Otherwise, we might make a transaction visible that is going to go away after a crash or a failover. Uh, but uh, we also have this uh, synchronous commit feature where we can decide per transaction that we don't have to, don't want this wait. We are happy with the transaction going away if there is a crash. Or not happy, but at least we are willing to accept that it's uh, it might go away. Uh, and in those cases, we skip the wait for the transaction log. So we just uh, commit and make it visible immediately the primary. And on the replica, uh, those, uh, those will arrive at the same time as the other ones that are waiting. So the waiting ones will become visible quite a long time later 
on the primary, whereas the synchronous commit ones will become visible earlier on the primary and later on the standby. So this means that uh, there is a pretty high probability that if you use a mix of synchronous commit on and off, you will see different uh, commit orders over your primaries and replicas. Whether you care, that's an application issue, but it's not consistent, definitely. And this is fundamentally a problem we cannot solve. We have to give up one of the following things. Uh, either our, um, we have to say that our commit order does not match on the primary and replica, and we are, we are fine with this. Or uh, we say we are willing to wait on synchronous commit off until the other ones uh, are replicated. Or the other one is uh, that we return when we do a commit that has synchronous commit off. Uh, we don't wait, but it doesn't become visible immediately. This means that we give up on the read your write consistency. So you do a write, you go back to read it, it's not there. Or the final one that we can give up is uh, that we can uh, also write in the, into the write ahead log. Uh, the actual visibility order. So when we replicate, the replica can make things visible in the same order. So we have to wait somewhere. So either we wait for the read to become visible, we wait on the write or other stuff that is uh, behind us to become visible, or we wait on the replica. So if we want consistency, somebody has to wait. But uh, Another big issue with this current solution is uh, that we might have a, a lost transaction while we are doing synchronous replication. So if you have synchronous replication turned on, when you do a commit, uh, it will wait until this commit hits the replica. The replica replies that it's safely on disk and only then we can make it visible and uh, tell the client this commit was successful. But now if the client uh, disconnects for some reason, there is a timeout, uh, the network connection fails, whatever reason there is, uh, this uh, connection will go away. This means also that the running transaction goes away, which means that this commit will become visible on the primary. And if there is a failover at this point, then somebody might see this uh, commit as visible, and then we fail over to a synchronous replica and the commit goes away. And then an example of why this is important, if you have uh, this logic that you try to do something, you commit, you wait for the commit to complete, and if you get an error, you retry and see if it's needed to insert. So you commit, connection fails, you retry, you see it as visible, say fine, it's done, and actually it's not after a failover. And also this, uh, what is motivating this talk is uh, this approach is, does not work for distributed systems uh, because distributed systems will make all of this uh, scalability problems and all of the consistency problems exponentially worse. Uh, so if we want to have a consistent view of uh, the database, a snapshot across shards in a sharded database, uh, we cannot use a distributed proc array and uh, use this to build a snapshot because uh, systems might fail. Uh, there are latency issues and all kinds of problems. So performance and real reliability basically means that a distributed proc array does not work. So here's a proposal to fix this stuff. Uh, this is typically called in Postgres world uh, CSN snapshots, uh, but as a, every good child, it has many different names. Uh, but the CSN stands for commit sequence number. And the core idea here is very simple. When we are committing this transaction, we assign it the commit sequence number. And this means uh, this is the order that things happen in the database. It might not uh, be totally wrong to think about it as a commit timestamp, even though for practical reasons, we cannot actually use a wall clock for this uh, because it might change or different transactions might uh, get uh, the same value. So we have to do a bit, bit of trickery, but basically we could use a commit time in there with some additions. 
we only need to ensure a couple of conditions holds. The main one is that this commit sequence number always goes forwards, never backwards. And we must be able to go from this transaction ID that we have stored on the rows, and we need to determine what is the commit sequence number for this, this transaction on disk. And if, uh, if those conditions hold, then we can make a snapshot just as CSN value. The snapshot is uh, that we see everything that is smaller than this commit sequence number. And this is not a particularly unique or uh, innovative idea. This is the standard way that stuff is done in distributed databases where we want to have at least some consistency across databases. So Google Spanner, Yugabyte, CockroachDB all, all do something similar and probably many others too that I don't know by heart. So the next question is, uh, which value do we use as this CSN number? The main requirement is that it's uh, monotonically increasing, but there are a few different options that we could use for this number. It doesn't have to be like we use every sequential number, we can skip values easily. So uh, the simplest answer is to use a simple counter. It's very simple and cheap to manage in a single system. And we actually do have a, this kind, type of counter already to implement serializable transactions. Uh, we could also use uh, the right head lock, lock position or LSN of this commit record. And the benefit of using something like that is that this is communicated to the standbys for free. But this uh, also means that our visibility order is tied to our uh, transaction log order that we might not want always. So we have to consider that. And another option is to use this wall clock time, which has some nice properties. Uh, we still have to do some things to ensure that uh, this never goes backwards. Uh, but uh, you can see like, for example, Yugabyte has a paper on hybrid time that uh, explains how we can uh, make sure in a distributed database that we never see CSN values go backwards in time. But to make sure that it goes forwards in time, we add a counter on top. It's basically, we get a timestamp and uh, there's a second field uh, which commit in under that timestamp is currently the latest one. And the nice part about using clock as the, as the CSN is that we can do some nifty stuff with uh, waiting for consistency and we can get consistency without communication when we use this. Given, given some constraints on how the system works with real time. So the things that we have to make sure within the system is uh, that after the commit becomes visible, uh, means that it gets a CSN that is published. No other commit can get a CSN value that is lower than, than we committed, which would, otherwise this would mean that the transaction pops out of thin air. We see it as not existing and later it exists. So th this is needed for immutable snapshots. Also, we need uh, that if a commit returns, uh, all new snapshots get a equal or bigger CSN. So this means that we can actually read uh, our writes. We can re relax this a bit by making note that if we commit, we make a note what is what was our CSN and tell the system that, uh, okay, we, we want to read and we want to see at least something that is later than our commit. This gives us causal consistency between systems, which is uh, good enough for many, many cases. But otherwise, we will have to communicate that when we commit, that every system in uh, will see that the minimum snapshot value is this commit CSN. And finally, when a read completes, uh, other reads should see a higher CSN. Otherwise, uh, we will see transactions that appear. If we look later, they disappear. We look again, they reappear. So that's that's not how databases should work. So we. We would like to see the visible CSN always move forwards. It's easy to do in a single system, slightly more tricky when we have multiple databases that need to communicate with each other.
another good question is uh, if we have this transaction ID on a row, how do we get to the CSN value that we calculated? A really simple way to do this is to just uh, write it down in an SLRU like we do for this sub transactions, like we do for commit timestamps or whether we committed or not. We can do a similar SLRU and uh, for throughput wise, it's not worse than commit TS, it might be megabyte a second or so. And the maximum size would be like 16 gigabytes. So this is perfectly feasible to do as an SLRU. And we already have this commit timestamp, which is kind of similar if you squint your eyes hard enough. So might, we might be able to reuse this or combine them or do something with those. And an interesting part is uh, that this uh, exact SLRU that is storing the information, did we commit or not? We can also replace this with this CSN value because if we don't have a CSN, we don't didn't commit. If we do have one, we committed. So this exact is replaced with it. And actually, uh, after, a, after a bit of time, when you don't uh, care about what was the exact order that stuff completed in, when it's long in the past and we know everything did complete, we can actually compress this uh, CSN SLRU into exact, which would make it 64 times smaller or whatever size we pick for our, uh, for our CSN. Uh, but the main issue with this mapping is uh, that it can become a performance issue. So if you remember these sub-transactions, you will see lots of blog posts around the internet uh, how these uh, sub-transactions become a performance issue uh, once you use too many of them. So those lookups can get quite expensive, especially if they don't fit into the cache we have within Postgres. Luckily, they are changeable in Postgres 17, but uh, still. It's not nice to have a this tunable where performance drops by an order of magnitude if you tune it wrong. But I do have some ideas how to fix this. So if we have a bit of time left, I will I will explain that part. So uh, one option that I mentioned is that we make the CSNs be the commit record LSN. Basically, this means that we acquire this commit sequence before we write this commit to our transaction log. And uh, this part is needed if you want to have a single transaction record per commit. We need to know then within this commit record, when did we commit? And if you do this, we have to uh, then coordinate after we wait for this uh, transaction log to hit disk and other replicas, we have to coordinate between the different waiters that we update the latest visible CSN in the correct order, which means that uh, we have to basically build a queue and everybody that, uh, uh, that is trying to commit the lower CSN value, uh, we will uh, wait until everybody behind us is uh, done committing. And we can do this uh, basically the same way that, way that we do this proc array group update. And this would be a fix for this non sequence commit because uh, it will not become visible even after uh, our backend goes away. The other, the other option is we, we can also determine the CSN value after the commit. Uh, but then uh, this uh, we have to communicate this to replicas as a separate uh, record or or over a separate channel. So there are a couple of different options, depending on when do we acquire this commit order and how do we sequence it with durability. And the visibility checks with this uh, new snapshot will be very simple. We just look up the CSN value for our transaction ID, we compare it with the snapshot CSN value, and that's it. And uh, we can add to this xmin and xmax values. They are still useful because we can then skip any updates. We can still can skip stuff that is uh, way in the future for our snapshots because we know that it possibly cannot have committed. And uh, we can skip uh, old stuff 
or look look them up in the PGX Act because uh, we don't care what order they committed in. They were they were already well and truly done before we started, and this helps us like optimize this lookup a bit. So what about sub transactions? What what do we do with those? Well, if you just uh, go into the CSN SLRU and update every sub-transaction ID that we acquired with our CSN value on commit, uh, then uh, that, that will be it. The, everything will just work. The issue might be that this takes a long time and we, uh, depending on how we sequence it with durability, somebody else might be waiting on uh, us going around and stamping our 10,000 sub-transactions with the correct CSN value. So if you don't want this waiting stuff, we can also do some tricks where we uh, carve out a bit of CSN space. We have some special values that uh, identify that uh, this XID is a sub-transaction. So when, when within this visibility check, we see that the CSN value that we looked up is a, actually a sub-transaction, we know, okay, for this row, we have to actually go and look at the parent row. And uh, because the CSN values are big enough, we can easily fit the actual XID value in them. So we don't have to do a subtrans lookup. We can actually skip all of this subtransaction SLRU stuff. But what about this synchronous commit problem where we have to wait somewhere so one proposal I have is that uh, when we do a synchronous commit off, by default, it will wait until everybody ahead of it will commit. This will affect users that do a mixed workload where they have some, uh, some commits are synchronous, some are synchronous commit off, and they want the synchronous commit off to run quickly. And uh, for them, this wait will be annoying. So we might uh, add for them a separate uh, uh, configuration variable where they can specify that uh, I want to do a fire and forget commit. That it will uh, probably succeed. Uh, and uh, I don't want to wait for the visibility. It will become visible at some point in time in the future. And when we uh, disable this synchronous visibility, we just skip uh, skip waiting for everybody ahead of us uh, to become visible and we, uh, we let somebody else make us visible later. And this might not be possible in all cases when we, when our transaction is modifying tables and stuff like that, we have locks. Uh, it's not possible to become visible later. When we are releasing locks, the stuff that we did must become visible immediately and there is no way to make those locks held for a long time. So. It's uh, there will be definitely some limitations when this could be used. And to fix uh, this uh, uh, read your rights issue, so if you have an application that doesn't want to wait for those uh, synchronous commit off transactions but still wants to see them at the same time, in theory, we could also have an add an option to read those. And maybe we can just reuse this read uncommitted stuff. To, to make sure that we can read stuff that probably is committed, but maybe not. But uh, as I said, this, uh, this will only affect the users that are using synchronous commit off, and they also want to see it right now. If they don't want to see it, uh, they can just turn off the synchronous visibility and everything will be fine. And to make this stuff uh, usable in a distributed system, uh, then we need to do some extra synchronization. So on a single machine, it's quite easy to uh, figure out that uh, uh, all other commits that are uh, before us are done committing before we commit. But uh, in a distributed system, we have to actually communicate uh, to make this happen. And uh, it's quite undesirable to coordinate with every other node in larger systems on every commit. So there are some tricks that systems use to make, make this easier. 
so for example, Google Spanner uh, uses this uh, true time API where they can get a timestamp uh, with an error bound. And when they commit, they just use this uh, timestamp as the commit sequence number, uh, but they uh, wait for the duration of this timestamp to make sure that uh, nobody else can. Uh, so to ensure that this commit uh, doesn't return before uh, every, everything before it is committed. And uh, on the reverse side, acquiring a snapshot will also need to be pessimistic about acquiring the snapshot. So it needs to have the lower bound. But uh, the problem with this type of approach is that first you, uh, it depends on the clocks being synchronized. And even if they are well synchronized, the error bounds are still some number of milliseconds typically. So. So it's a non-trivial amount of latency on every commit for this approach. And the different approach that is uh, being used is uh, Yugabyte's uh, hybrid time approach, where they uh, depend on uh, simple NTP clocks, where the clock is uh, synchronized over NTP. And if the time changes, they don't change the time immediately, but they just uh, speed up or slow down the clock. So we, we still have monotonic timestamps. And we, uh, the system still has to check that it is monotonic and it has to eagerly communicate the timestamps between systems to ensure everybody agrees that time is moving forwards. Uh, but uh, if this timestamp uh, that the system thinks is the latest one is eagerly communicated between uh, both the servers and the clients, uh, it's actually possible to get an illusion of consistency without waiting. So it's still possible to see inconsistent results if you read something and then you go make a new connection and you forget your timestamp you were given and you might see a stale result. But uh, if you are using the database as you are supposed to, you can get consistent results. So it, it is a good uh, middle ground option. And it's still possible to wait always, of course. So. But uh, one thing that this snapshot stuff doesn't fix is the replay lag on the replica. So we still have to, if we commit in the primary and we want to read from the replica, we have to wait for the transaction log to make it over to the replica, replica to replay it, make it visible, and then we get a snapshot and then we can read it. So we have to wait until we can read from replicas. And there will be some complications to make it happen transparently. So again, this uh, communicated latest timestamp might be a useful concept there. Okay. And now uh, to discuss how we might make this CSN stuff faster. So as I said, uh, uh, looking up those uh, CSN values for our XIDs might get quite expensive. So there is an idea I have that uh, could uh, fix this, but uh, we have to actually test whether this is bad enough and do we have any simpler ideas how to fix it. So probably we don't want to implement this as the first cut. But the main part of that idea is uh, that if you have this CSN type snapshot, that's a, that has an X min, X max, and the CSN. Uh, we can build a traditional Postgres snapshot uh, using this algorithm described here. We just loop through all of the XID values between X min and X max, and we compare it with the CSN and we mark down which ones were running. And this uh, this always results in the same result as we would have gotten if we had done this proper A trickery. And the nice thing is we don't have to do it all at once. We can do it incrementally. So we can only scan sm some of it and we can keep track of a threshold. So everything below CSN uh, Xmin is in the XIP array. Everything above that, we have to look up the CSN for. So why do we want to do this? So uh, we have we have to look up the CSN for every row between X min and X max. Uh, but if we have any long running transactions, so anything that is writing to the database and is doing that for minutes or hours at a time, uh, that will make this X min and X max range be quite big. 
and this this means that there are lots of rows that uh, we have to look up. So uh, if we stick those long running transactions in a separate array, we can tighten the range where we have to do do those CSN lookups. Uh, uh, we can tighten that range into a much much smaller one. That means we have to do less of those CSN values, and maybe even more importantly, there is a higher probability that they will be in cache when we do this. And to ensure that they are in cache, uh, this enables us to do a ring buffer to store store those CSN values. So if we if we store our CSN in an SLRU, we first have to do a like a lookup. So we we have an X ID number one two three. We have to first figure out okay uh, where where in our SLRU is this stored? Do we have it in cache? Do we not have it in cache? And once we have this looked up, then we can look up within it the actual CSN value. But if we have a ring buffer, we can just uh, blindly read the value and then double check is that still valid or not. So we can do it in a really nice lock free way. Uh, but uh, because uh, we might also have long running read transactions, uh, they they also need to have the, this x min and x max value available for CSN translation, and this value will be going backwards in time essentially in the ring buffer. So we are we are adding new stuff on top, at, and at some point we will be overwriting all of our all of our CSN values that are needed for those long running transactions. So we need to convert those one, those ones to be using this XIP array also. So within shared memory, we might have basically an array of those uh, CSN values, and we will have some like clock hands within this uh, ring buffer, which uh, specify where is going to be the next transaction that we will hand out. Uh, then we'll, we will have a CSN X min value, uh, where everything that is uh, smaller than that, that will be evicted into a separate place, where we can quickly include it into snapshots. And uh, finally, we will have this global CSN next min, uh, where we know that uh, no other snapshot is going to need this data. So everybody that is looking at CSNs will be looking at higher, higher XID values than this. And then in the level two, we might have like a simple sorted array of XID to CSN values. And this is basically built on hope. Hopefully the transactions will commit before we have to move the CSN X menu X min value past them. So we hope that we commit before we get tagged as a long running transaction before we drop out. And hopefully most snapshots are released before we have to actually do any conversion. Uh, but if you have a large enough ring buffer and we do some poking about this conversion stuff, uh, we can make those hopes come true. So I'm gonna skip uh, skip uh, half of this stuff, but the uh, important part is we can, this will also allow us to do some batch operations. So when we are moving this, those clock hands up, we can do them like a thousand transactions at a time. And then, uh, for example, convert uh, those uh, CSN values into exact values. So we compress them into did commit, did not commit values in a batch. And doing stuff in a batch always makes things a lot faster, like an order of magnitude. And the visibility check in that case will be uh, somewhat similar to, to how it works currently. Uh, we have this uh, x max and x min checks, and then we will uh, branch on the CSN value. If it's lower, we do this old old style XIP check. If it's bigger, then we uh, read uh, read the value from the ring buffer and we check that uh, this value was not evicted. Okay, and to quickly cover uh, existing work on this. There is a patch uh, by Andre Lepikov and others uh, that is implementing this global snapshot stuff. And they, uh, this patch is assigning CSN during this uh, proc array n transaction. So while we are making ourselves visible and then uh, is uh, writing it to write the head log. 
and it means that um, replica visibility is postponed in, until this uh, visibility record arrives. And the other one that is currently more active is uh, Heike is working on making CSN snapshots available on standbys, uh, which means uh, it simplifies a lot of stuff on the standbys and it may simplifies also the patch. And the idea is to get it to 18. So that's it. Thanks. Do we have questions or no? Um, so if you have questions, I suggest you take them offline because the time for this talk is over. Okay, so find me, find me in the hallway. Yes, that's a very good idea.